Good evening and welcome everyone from the Trinidad Christian Center and the Church of South India. We had so far 22 lectures covering all the New Testament books. This evening would be the 23rd lecture. We are now taking up some of the contemporary readings of the New Testament. Last week we had a very interesting topic on contextual interpretation of the New Testament from Dr. Stanley Jones. And this evening we have Sister Prema to give a lecture on feminist interpretation of the New Testament. And the session will be moderated by Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti a professor of New Testament uh, from the Union Biblical Seminary. I now invite Dr. Johnson to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, my friend Millun, for uh, this wonderful opportunity, especially ECC and the Church of South India, uh, for granting this uh, uh, great opportunity to moderate this session. And uh, dear friends, uh, well-wishers, and uh, colleagues, and uh, today we are privileged to have the 23rd lecture in the series of wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics. And today we are privileged to have a very significant and very uh, experienced biblical scholar who is none other than Professor, Dr. Sister Prema Vakil. Let me introduce her in a few uh, seconds. Professor, Dr. Sister Prema Vakil is a religious sister belonging to the congregation of the Carmelite Sisters of St. Teresa, that means CSST, holds a doctorate from St. Peter's, Bangalore, and a, and a post-doctorate from Tantur Ecumenical Institute, Jerusalem, in Biblical Theology. Professor of New Testament and Research Guide at the St. Peter's Pontifical Institute, Bangalore, member of the consultative body of the Biblical Commission of Catholic Conference of Bishops of India, CCBI, Executive Member of Catholic Biblical Association of India, CBAI, and Member of the Editorial Board of Word and Worship. She is former President of Society of Biblical Studies in India, SBSI, and CBAI, that means Catholic Biblical Association of India. Member of the Review Team of New Living Translation Catholic Edition, that means NLTC and English Standard Version Catholic Edition ESVCE. So she is author of author of Women Shall Prophesy, Anna the Prophetess, based on Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. That is a study in Luke's a feminine perspective and the editor of Biblical Perspectives of Family in the Context of Synod on Family, Call to Self-Emptying, Biblical Perspective, and all these are published by Theological Publications in India. And she also authored articles in Indian Theological Studies and other journals and edited works. So my dear friends, this is my privilege. So is that uh, for a long span of time, I am hearing, okay, uh, Dr. Sister Prema's lectures, and she helped us in our previous series also, wider contextualized biblical spirituality. And we were all privileged to have her then. And now we are going to have a lecture on the feminist interpretation of the New Testament. So now I am handing over the time to uh, Professor Dr. Sister Prema Vagil. It is yours. So thank you, Dr. Johnson. 
Tom Sruti, for your kind words of introduction. I take this opportunity to thank Father Matthew Chandra Gunnelli, CC President, and Dr. Thompson, uh, Dr. Johnson Tom Sruti, for the, uh, you know, for organizing this seminar. And you know, I am happy to be part of this series of lectures. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my understanding of this feminine perspective of the biblical interpretation. Uh, so our uh, procedure will be today for this lecture. First, we shall see the terminology feminism because the very terminology feminism sometimes put the mind off of some. Therefore, we shall clarify the term feminism. Then we go to the history of the modern feminist approach, a brief survey. We shall have then the principle and methods of feminist interpretation. Then we shall start from there, the present position of the feminist hermeneutical approach. Then we shall study a sample text from the Pauline letters to see how this feminine perspective of interpretation works on this text and we shall conclude the session with uh, an application. So this is our procedure for our, uh, for our uh, presentation of this lecture. And so now I leave, uh, I, I, I mean, I share the screen with you and you can hear my voice. Okay, so. By the way, you have joined the elite. Okay. Uh, so I begin with uh, uh, the, the Pontifical Biblical Commissions publication on the interpretation of the Bible in the church. In the pre preface of this document, then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger noted that the study of the Bible is never finished. Each age must in its own way newly seek to understand the sacred books, Article 1705. Taking into account the recent developments in the biblical scholarship, the document amounted to a concise but competent treatise of hermeneutic methodology. Just a minute. Just a minute, just a minute. Some problem with this. So take your time. Uh, I'll just share this. Okay, the document acknowledges the abiding validity of the historic critical methods from numbers 1717 to 1728 with its limitation 1729 to 1734. Then it surveys new approaches 1736 to 1808. And among the new approaches, the liberationalist and feminist approaches are cautiously acknowledged. It is here that we are going to uh, you know, implement this uh, uh, principles of feminist hermeneutics. That means that feminist, uh, feminist hermeneutics are 
uh, acknowledged by the church. That's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, so recognizing the benefits of the feminist exegesis, the document says, a quote from the document itself, women have played a more active part in exegetical research. They have succeeded often better than men in detailing. <laughs> Indicating the presence, the significance, and the role of women. Sister, your screen is not visible to us. In the Bible, in Christian origins, and in the church, the world view because of its greater attention to the dignity of women and to their role in society and in the church ensures that new questions are put to the biblical text, which in turn occasions new discoveries Feminine sensitivity helps unmask and correct certain community commonly accepted interpretations which were tendentious and sought to justify the male domination of women. So this is one of the quote from the, uh, the document itself. Uh, I, I don't know that you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? We can't see. No screen is seen. No screen is seen. Text, uh, a, a quote from the biblical, uh, the commission published the interpretation of the Bible in the church from the preface I was reading it. How important it is for the feminist interpretation in the uh, church and how the church promotes that. That's what I was talking about. And we go to now the clarification of the term feminism. What is feminism? It's sometimes when you speak about the term feminism, uh, could be understood mainly many different ways. Some avoid using the term because it conjures up for them images of angry women who hate men. So that is not how the fem feminist biblical scholars understood it. So feminism is a perspective and movement that spring from recognition of inequities, in inequities, okay, not inequities, inequities towards women, and it advocates for change in whatever structures prevent full flourishing of the human community and all creation. So, feminism therefore demands a commitment to feminism, and it means that one is willing to work for change, both in interpersonal relationship and in transforming structures that maintain inequity towards women. Okay. So, I think this uh, definition clarifies uh, the, uh, the term. So, by this definition, Feminism is beneficial for both women and men. It is not only really for women, but it is also meant for men, right thinking people. So it does not seek to replace systems of male domination with the structures in which women dominate. Rather, it seeks the equal good of all. So feminists today recognize not only the gender perspectives, but also race, classes and cultures are determinative factors in how one understands the biblical text. So that is in a nutshell what we speak about the feminism. Uh, now, there are other terminologies for feminism because to, you know, this feminism is occurred in the, in the uh, Western uh, cultural milieu uh, so the realities of white Western educated women who were the first to call themselves are feminist. And this may not be applicable. This term may not be applicable, applicable for all the cultures because the cultural background is different for every woman. So many ways from those of from non-dominant cultures and women in Asia, Africa, Latin America, likewise. And okay. the perspective of, perspective of women who are poor or illiterate are very different 
from those of well-educated and financially secure. Therefore, to draw attention to the double oppression of racism and sexism they experience, many African women use the term womanist, and some Hispanic feminists call themselves mujeristas, mujer means woman in Spanish, while others prefer Latina feminist, recognizing the struggle for women's equality and dignity is intimately connected with the efforts for justice towards the earth and well-being for the whole of cosmos. Many call themselves as eco-feminist. So you have a variety of terms for feminism, the womanist, womanist the mujeristas, the eco-feminist, Latina feminist, and so on. So one terminology uh, is not enough uh, to describe uh, from, uh, what is feminism from place to place. Now, where do you situate the feminist approach? Generally, the feminist approach is one among the many approaches of biblical interpretation. And particularly, it can be located within the contextual approaches and more specifically within the liberation list of approaches. Okay, so it is, uh, uh, it is uh, within the wider perspective of the biblical interpretation, historical critical methods and so on. Particularly, it can be located within the contextual approaches. And last lecture we have seen this and more specifically within the liberation list of approaches. Now, what is the foundation for the biblical, uh, the feminist uh, hermeneutics? Is there a foundation? So I will go to the biblical and the hagiographical foundation for feminist interpretation of the scripture. The development of the scholarly methods of feminist biblical interpretation is relatively recent, but women interpreting the scriptures from their own perspectives are not just recent phenomenon. It stretches back to the biblical time itself at least we have one instance in the second book of Kings, chapter 22, verses 14 to 20, which is repeated in second Chronicles, chapter 34, verses 23 to 28, the story of prophetess Kulda interpreting the book of the law to King Josiah's emissary. So this itself is an indication that the women were interpreters of the Bible uh, in the, from the time of the biblical period onwards. Okay, neither the women challenging the tradition is new. It is not a recent phenomenon. We have a story of the five daughters of Selophehad in the book of Numbers, Numbers 27, 1 to 11, repeated the story in chapter 36, 1 to 12, and in the book of Jos Jos Josiah, Sorry, Joshua 17, 3 to 6. So it is not only in modern times women have challenged the patriarchal interpretations. The fourth century hagiography of Saint Helia, Helia, consecrated virgin in the second century CE, relates how she interpreted 1 Corinthians 7 9 before a judge. Like the contemporary scholars who use historical critical methods. She questions the notion that a biblical text has one meaning that is applicable in all situations. Uh, so you see, uh, we have uh, people uh, who have uh, challenged the interpretation which comes from the patriarchal background and uh, who has viewed that there cannot be only one interpretation of the Bible there can be many interpretation from the life situation of the one who interprets. So in the medieval times, the first written commentaries on scripture from a critical feminist point of view emerged. Among the earliest they preserved are the writings of Hildegard of Bingen, 1098 to 1179, a German mystic and abbess of two Benedictine monasteries. She's the one who first wrote her experience and uh, uh, that was the commentary, but we have it in the medieval times. Okay, so having said this background of uh, 
you know, the feminist interpretation that is not a recent phenomena. Already it was there from the biblical period, from the medieval period, from the, uh, from the you know, prior to the modern feminist approach. We come to the second point now, the history of the modern feminist approach. Okay. So the root of modern feminist biblical scholarship goes back to the mid 19th century and the slavery movement and the struggle for women's suffrage in the United States. So the origin of the modern feminist biblical approach is from the United States related to the women's struggle to right to vote. From the inauguration of the movement of women's emancipation, the Bible has been used to hold her in the divinely ordained sphere presented in the Old and the New Testament. Okay. So, so in this scenario, women like Sarah in 1790 to 1873 and Angelina Grimke, these are two uh, sisters of Quakers from the slaveholding family in South Carolina, spoke out both against slavery and for women's rights. When men sought to keep them from speaking in public by citing Paul's instruction that the women should be silent, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, the sisters set about learning biblical Greek and Hebrew so that they could interpret the Bible for themselves. Okay, so this is a landmark. It's a new beginning. Oh, the first phase of the, uh, the feminist what is that, scholarships development. Now, oh, during yes. this period, the first full blown yeah, commentary on. on the Bible was produced. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, 1815 to oh, Dr. Johnson Thomas, could they please uh, uh, mute your mute your? Sisters seems to be muted. Rema, yours is muted actually. Please unmute it. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we are able to hear you. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so what we're talking about, uh, the women's proponent of women's right to vote in the United States published a two volume commentary in the Women's Bible, 1895 and 1898. It's a collection of commentaries designated to highlight biblical women and expose the patriarchal uh, mindset of the scripture. So that was a landmark during the, this first phase of the feminist development. Okay, we go to the second phase. In the second phase, though the feminist movement began in the middle of the 19th century, theological and scriptural foundations were provided only in 20th century. This can be termed as the second phase of feminist interpretation this second wave of feminism spurred a new work in the feminist biblical scholarship. The encounter between feminism and theology was given an added, added impetus, especially in the Catholic space, by the Second Vatican Council. It became a systematic and academic endeavor in 1970s. So the women explored and developed hermeneutical frames of analysis in dialogue with the feminist critical theory, a notable work as the feminist interpretation of the biblical edited by Letty Russell, in which 11 leading women biblical scholars have contributed at this second phase of the development. It is here that the famous work of Elizabeth Schusler Fioronza has been most influential, her inaugural text in memory of her much appreciated, much known uh, published in 1983. So they read the biblical text with the developing gender critical lens using a range of biblical methodologies. 
feminist, feminist biblical scholars moved from historical critical studies to more and more refined literary approaches in dialogue with the feminist literary critics. So in this stage also, from the historical critical method, they started to move from of move to more of um, you know the the, the contextual approaches. Okay, the third phase we have again uh, the publication of the interpretation of the Bible in the church has made a significant stride in the growth of the feminist, particularly among the Catholics. Biblical interpretation, there has been a growing interest in the re-examination of many biblical passages and a dynamic way of interpreting the scripture. This phase embraced a clarion call towards the inclusion of minoritized voices in history, society, and religion. Okay, so there is a, from the feminist feminism or the women's issue to it moved a step further to the the voices the uh, the people who are minoritized in the society religion and in the history so so that is in short the survey of our um, the development of the modern feminist interpretation we go to now another point why a feminist interpretation we have so many interpretations. So why a feminist interpretation? So uh, there are many reasons. I just want to pinpoint a few of them. First of all, there are texts which are oppressive to women. Okay. Uh, like, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 24, which calls the wives to be subject to their husband. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, which forbid the women to teach. Likewise, I'm just giving you a few examples. So, so these are texts which are oppressive. So like this, there are many texts, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, which are oppressive and use this to oppress women. Secondly, there are interpretations which are oppressive to women. For example, you have the Mary of Magdala, commonly known as Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, the most famous of Jesus' female disciple, disciples. Uh, you have, uh, she has been regarded as a former prostitute in traditional history, yet there is no scriptural evidence to support this claim. Okay, so this is a misinterpretation of, uh, um, you know, Mary Magdalene's image in the history. Instead of this, she was the chief among those who were ministering to Jesus and waiting at the foot of the cross, according to Matthew 27, 56, Mark 15, 40, John 19, 25. She was also the chief among those who were there when the body of Jesus was laid to rest in the tomb, Matthew 27, 61, Mark 15, 47. She was chief among those who came to the sepulcher after the Sabbath day, Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 1, Luke 24, 10. Again, she's the first one to whom the risen Lord showed himself you go to the uh, Mark 16, 9, testifies to this again, John 20, 11 to 16. She is the one who sent the apostles to proclaim the Easter kerygma. He is risen, the first messenger of the Easter kerygma to, uh, to, the, to the apostles. Therefore, rightly it is called in the apostle of the apostles. So Mary Magdalene that stands out among all the disciples of Jesus as a singular woman. Okay? Unfortunately, in late Christian tradition, she has been interpreted as sinner, and this false traditional interpretation still remains popular and contributes to viewing women as commodities. Okay. So this is one of the impact of the misinterpretation of the text. Thirdly, you have 
there are texts which have forgotten the contribution made by women in the formation of the bible often they remain as passing remarks for example you have in the infancy narrative of luke at the episode of jesus presentation at the temple there are two prophetic figures appearing luke 22 22 to 38 Simeon and Anna, the prophetess. Now, you shall see here, while two prophecies or two oracles are attributed to Simeon, one concerning the child Jesus and the other concerning Mother Mary, to Anna, no prophecy is attributed. Yet Luke says, she prophesied. What did she prophesy? This is not in the Bible. Okay. and in fact in the whole of the new testament you have only only she is uh, coming in the uh, in the context of jesus life as a prophet as bearing witness to jesus as the messiah fourthly there are also passages in the new testament concerning women which were or who were not highlighted by the interpreters of the past example the confession of martha in john 11:27 yes lord i believe that you are the christ the son of god he who is coming into this world that was the confession of martha at the death of her brother lazarus okay because uh, she thought that is it is 3 days are passed since he died and it is impossible for him to come to life when but when jesus said i am the resurrection and the life she articulated her faith in that confession and it is very notable here this is a confession equal only to that of peter who proclaimed at caesarea philippi you are the christ the son of the living god mark matthew 16 16 luke 9 20 mark 8 29 about what the synoptic writers consider as the supreme declaration of faith in Jesus made by a man is presented in John pronounced by a woman yet pious christian readers of the gospels have been unduly influenced negatively by the words of Jesus in Luke to Martha 10:41 to 42 she said Martha Martha you are worried about many things one thing is necessary we always go by that text uh, the two sisters when martha complains about mary uh, it looks as if jesus is taking up for mary looks as if okay, so this seemingly derogative words of jesus have unfortunately colored traditional perception of martha in the church okay so we have conveniently forgotten the confession she made is so now we have the fifth reason why we have the um, feminist interpretation there are many women in the new testament uh, as in the old testament unnamed indicating that they have no identity no name means no identity for example you have in mark 14 3 to 9 the evangelist records the story of a woman who anoints the head of Jesus and Jesus prophesies that wherever the good news is proclaimed her deeds will be remembered ironically in this text the biblical author does not name the woman while Jesus says that her name will be proclaimed everywhere the text doesn't have her name this is an irony again in the passion narrative of matthew the whole of passion narrative of, of, of on all the four gospels only one person comes to jesus defense and that is a, a woman and that is recorded by uh, matthew it is none other than the wife of pilot supposed to be a official she herself and uh, and that 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 is a woman so the wife of pilot Matthew 27:19 but again irony is that 
her name is not mentioned anywhere of course in the in the christian tradition um, her name is remembered as uh, procula procula prodias procula okay christian tradition but in the text we don't have their name so so what what do the uh, what do the feminists therefore do so feminist interpreters we have seen these text the problems of the text and in the uh, problems of the interpretation so the feminist interpreters uh, try to restore the history of the women back to them remembering and reconstructing the past history of women's presence and participation in discipleship and mission in order to have a holistic approach to the bible in order to have a holistic approach to the bible otherwise the bible is lopsided one sided there is only the the story of one particular group the other group is forgotten so and also to have a complete history of the church okay so highlighting the contribution of only one group we cannot have the the holistic history of the church is so feminist not only really retrieve positive traditions about women they also remember the stories of rape and dismemberment in the old testament for example we have judges chapter 19 um, rather rather than rip these out of the bible it is important to remember and tell such stories with the purpose of exposing the way they sanction violence against the women and insisting never again we cannot go on with that we need to put a full stop to that this is one text i have taken from the old testament there are texts which propagate particularly in the old testament you have uh, you know giving sanction for the violence against the women so we need to expose this interpret this instead of ripping the text away from the uh, bible uh, we need to expose and say that uh, no more this kind okay all right now we go to the uh, the third uh, the what are the principles and the method that we employ to interpret the the text concerning women or from the feminist perspective so a few principles that i have pointed out here uh, we can list a few principles of a starting point of feminist hermeneutics from the feminist hermeneutics starts with number 1 attending the experiences and the perspectives of women from multiple contexts since there is no universal women's experience okay there is no one you know one experience for all women uh, their experiences are different therefore uh, it comes uh, we start to do the hermeneutics the interpretation of the bible from the context multiple contexts of the women's experience second we have analyzing the interpreters social location the interpreters social location seeing how that affects the lenses one bring to the interpretation of the text okay third c you have evaluating what the text does to those who accept it does it liberates and lead to the fullness of life for all or does it reinforce the system of domination okay. and d engaging the powers of creative imagination the interpreter and employ the creative imagination to envision a world in which equality and dignity of women is a fact so in the overall perspective we are looking forward to what is going to happen what is going to achieve it is uh, that women should be the dignity uphold the dignity of women so this list which i have uh, proposed the pr few principles i have noted here are not comprehensive uh, you can elaborate this list many more according to the situation of the persons and the text now so uh, what are the methods that we use 
The methods what we use first it is a historical criti critical method itself. But uh, historical critical method is used in feminist revision. Okay. So the customary steps found in this method are set in the feminist context. They are examined in terms of feminism. For example, you have textual criticism and translation. This is one of the uh, discipline which comes under the term of historical critical method. Uh, what does textual criticism and translation do? It reconstructs the Hebrew or Greek original text of a biblical writing by comparing the ancient traditions of manuscripts. Okay, so that we can come to nearly, uh, you know, uh, what are the variations in order to find the variations. Okay, so how do you apply this in the feminist interpretation? The textual variations in the book of Acts regarding false companion Prisca is something notable. The textual variation in the Acts itself is very notable, but regarding when it comes to women is more notable. Variations in the Western text of Acts, which is based on Codex Bessie, designated as B, relegate Paul's companion Prisca or Priscilla to the background in favor of her marriage partner Aquila, causing her to disappear altogether as a co-worker of Jesus. Okay, so when the wherever is projected, she is projected as the wife of Aquila rather than the one who actually risked her life for Jesus. We have that in Romans chapter 16. Okay, so this is one of the problem with the translations, variations in the text. So, so textual criticism therefore try to uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, come to uh, if, uh, more original text or find out the variations, what are, and reconstruct uh, the text. Now, form criticism, how do the form criticism comes into the service of the feminist interpretation? This is a classic method that hold together text and the social setting. It refers to the sits in Leben. For example, I take one example from the Old Testament, though we are dealing with the New Testament. A victory song refers to the celebration which was prepared for the warriors returning after victorious battle you have in the book of Judges. And a dirge refers to a village responding to death. Many of these forms are in oral tradition. And normally in the book of uh, uh, Judges you have these victory songs are done, sung by women. Women. Okay. So discovery of these oral forms uncovers possible sources of women's literature and studies of the biblical text shows that these songs, which was originally of women, transmitted in context are authorized by men or are reflective of androcentric perspective. For example, you have Miriam's song, Exodus 15, it's a victory song after crossing the Red Sea. You have in that chapter, Exodus 15, the title is given, it's the song sung by Moses. And after everything is over, big paragraph is over, last you have a few lines appended to that saying, and Miriam also sang. But originally, the victory songs belong to uh, who, women. We have in the book of Judges, Jephthah's daughter, one example. Uh, Jephthah's daughter, when Jephthah became victorious and came, and she goes singing the victory song to in honor of her father and receive the father. So that's an example that victory songs were originally the uh, belong to women. Dirges belong to women. Another one, what we can from the uh, from as, as I have already pointed out, the prophetic oracle of Anna. Where did it disappear? Where did it disappear? in Luke 2, 36 to 38. So we may, we may have to look for the, uh, the, the oracles that made in the prophetic, women prophetic tradition in the church and in the New Testament in order to discover more about this. Okay. Now, history of tradition, the second, the third one. History of tradition studies how the biblical cultures 
is formed, culture is formed, biblical culture is formed. Again, we come to the tradition of Miriam, is composed of different elements. The motif of a woman prophet who is a singer and ecstatic, Exodus 20, 15 and following. And she's someone who receives revelation, Numbers 12, 1 following. And the motif of woman co-leader the, in the Exodus, you have Micah 6, 4. Another element is the tradition is of, of her tradition is her own grave mentioned in Numbers 20, chapter 20, verse 1. So this bundle of motives points to the tradition of Miriam confirming the great significance of this woman. Very often it test the uh, the text um, you know indicates that and she is the sister of Moses. She becomes important because she is the sister of Moses. Okay. Coming to the New Testament, you have the tradition of women as head of the house churches in Acts 12, 12 to 17, 16, 12 to 15, and 14, and numerous letters of Paul suggest the women. Uh, you know, women Women are the, of course, the ecclesia began in a household, in a family, and naturally that family is the domain of the women, therefore the women's leadership in the house churches. Okay. And uh, which we need to reconstruct this tradition of the contribution of women in the spread of the word and expansion of the uh, a mission as well as expansion of church. Ecclesia began from the family and that was the domain of women. Okay, and the tradition what we have in the New Testament in the uh, spreading out from the uh, Gospels to the letters, particular letters of Paul, women's ministries in the New Testament. History of this tradition is to be traced uh, by uh, the or are tracing by the feminist interpreters. Otherwise, we're not known. Okay. Now, reductional criticism. How the reductional criticism is put it into practice? We have the feminist, feminist interpretation pressed in the service, the reduction critical method to bring out the importance of the women in the life of Jesus. For example, Using the reduction critical method, bring out the importance of the Galilean women. In Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, the women who followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, and this methodology helped us to reconstruct the text uh, to present these women as the eyewitnesses to the Christian charisma, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. So, while we are using the historical critical method, we are not simply using it as we, we used to use it, but we see how these methodologies can help us to reconstruct the text concerning the women and the contribution made by the women. Okay. Uh, now we go to the two added criteria feminist, feminist interpreters add to this historical, historical critical methods, the feminist uh, hermeneutic add two criteria. One is hermeneutics of suspicion. We have, I think, already dealt with this in the last lecture. What is this hermeneutics of suspicion? What we speak so much in the feminist interpretation? Approaching the test with the consciousness that the Bible has a past history and a social cultural milieu. It was written for the most part by men's purpose and from patriarchal socio-cultural milieu. While Bible is the revered word of God that authentically communicates God's desires for humanity, feminist, feminist scholars recognize the fallible human instruments that have shaped the traditions we have received. Therefore, look at the text with a suspicion that is much more than what is said in the text is there yet to be recovered. Okay. Yet to be recovered. Okay. Now, under another criteria, what we add to this is the liberation theology. 
feminist liberationist biblical interpretation does not remain an intellectual exercise but culminates in action aimed at transforming relationship patterns and systems toward a renewed world and church in which men and men and women or and all creation thrive in the fullness of life envisioned by jesus okay so it is not only an intellectual gymnastic but the application of that uh, you know aiming at, uh, at the transforming relationship patterns and bringing out a church or a society where there is a place for women okay now uh, the feminist hermeneutical uh, approach also add modern critical methods they use also the modern critical methods of biblical interpretation such as structuralism literary criticism semiotics narratology intersectionality reader response criticism psychological analysis criticism and very particularly deconstruction and even in some cases when we interpret we use eclectic methods combining two or more methods so we cannot just uh, stick on to one method uh, sometimes many methods are needed to bring out the real meaning of the text okay so uh, having said that uh, now we go to a sample text i just wanted to say something now in the last class we were speaking about also uh, how do we uh, the 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 work that is done so far by the feminist hermeneutics can be compared can be consolidated or brought under three categories i think we have seen that in the last lecture so i just to remind you this one is the hermeneutics of recuperation we have seen that in the last lecture recuperation in this approach feminist interpreters aim to recover the biblical text from patriarchal mindset or patriarchal mistranslation and misinterpretation through their rereading they attempt to reclaim the text positive to women okay that is uh, the hermeneutics of recuperation so i'm just saying how the Uh, the present position of the feminist hermeneutical uh, methodologies can be brought into uh, three uh, categories the first is the hermeneutic of recuperation second hermeneutic of suspicion which we have already seen uh, if the hermeneutics of recuperation is test affirming the hermeneutics of suspicion does not presuppose the feminist authority and truth of the bible but take as its starting point the assumption that the biblical text and their interpretations are androcentric and serve patriarchal purpose okay the third one the third category of this is uh, hermeneutics of resistance okay. the third approach is an ideological reading a deliberate effort effort to read against the grains of text of disciplinary norms of traditions and cultures in other words the resistance readings demonstrate the fundamental openness to the text and how the meaning cannot be determined absolutely by itself okay so that's the meaning of hermeneutics of resistance mostly the post modern feminist belong to this category uh, because they use also apply various modern hermeneutical methods such as what we have already seen structuralism literary criticism and so on having said this now we go to a sample text quickly we have running we have few minutes more a sample text we take a sample text from the undisputed pauline letters what could be called as pauline summary on women's role in the early christianity romans chapter 16 verses 1 to 16 which would serve as windows through which one can get glimpses of the leadership role of women in the pauline church so we are just analyzing quickly this text okay 
Hey, so uh, when we look into chapter 16, verses 1 to 16 of uh, Paul, Pauline letter, there are a few positive elements in the structure of the text itself. Uh, you must keep in mind, this is the letter, uh, which is the letter uh, is of greeting. Paul greets everyone who has contributed to his mission and supported him. And uh, there are a number of people, names are mentioned in this letter, uh, for whom, uh, to whom Paul is, um, you know, very grateful for helping him to expand or to uh, develop his mission. So what are these positive elements in the structure of this text? First, the proportion of women in this list of greetings. Okay. Out of 29 people mentioned in this, 10 are women. Okay. Normally, we... Uh, Paul, Paul is uh, not a friend of women or I think anti-women, but this text specifies he is not. Okay, out of 29 people, 10 are uh, women. Second, the balance in the opening sequence of the letter, two women, two men. There is a parallelism. Two women, two men. One woman, one man. You can read the text at, at your leisure and see how this is operating. The third uh, positive element in the uh, letter is the range of specific roles. It is greater for women. The specific roles assigned is greater for women. Uh, two of the highest roles are ascribed to women, that is a deacon and apostle in this letter. Okay. Two of the highest uh, roles. Okay, all the roles are... Uh, good roles, but why I say the highest role in the sense uh, when it comes to this ecclesiastical spectrum and so on, the leadership. Now, uh, we have, uh, who, first of all, who is this deaconess? We have a woman named there, Phobe. She is the one to whom the letter of commendation is given. This is a letter of commendation, okay? Letter of commendation given to Phobe, commending her to the church at Rome. She belongs to church at St. and she is commended by Paul asking the church at Rome to receive her uh, and treat her well because she is the leader of the church in St. So if we are prone to think that the Fobe being a woman needed a recommendation for her safety, it may not be quite true. It is likely, but not explicitly stated, that she was the carrier of the letter to the Romans, and thus she is the personal envoy of Paul. Okay. She's the personal envoy of Paul. You have that in verses 1 to uh, 2. You know? uh, so, uh, okay, that you need to keep in mind. Now, what is the identity of this uh, woman, Phobe, the deaconess? What is her identity? Okay. Her position in the early Christian missionary movement is characterized by three titles. She is our sister, the minister or leader, the Agnos, of the church at the century, and the benefactor, patrona, of many and even Paul himself. So you have a title, sister, she's our sister, she's the Agnos minister, and she is a benefactor, patrona of the church. Okay, therefore she is important in the Pauline church. Okay. Now uh, you have here, you can analyze those terminologies and see how this her ministry or office was, uh, you know, uh, something which is um, much high with a leadership role, you know, the office of a leader, leader of uh, a, a local church she was uh, in the light of the other um, text from the Pauline letters, particularly Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, we can analyze these, uh, 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 these titles and see how important she was for the church. Okay, because of lack of time, we don't enter into that much. The second uh, uh, a group of people, the couple, Prisca and Aquila, Romans 16, 3 to 5. They are called Paul's co-workers to whom not only Paul himself, but all Gentile churches owe a debt of gratitude 
when Paul was in danger, probably Ephesus, they risked their lives for him. Not only they, but also the church in their house received greetings. Exegetes have long recognized that it is unusual that in four out of six New Testament texts, Prisca is mentioned before Aquila. The reason for Prisca's prominence in the Pauline letters and acts must be her prominence in the early Christian missionary movement. Okay. You have another couple, Andronicus and Junia, whom uh, Paul greets, 16, chapter 16, verses 7 to 8. While Prisca and Aquila do not receive Paul's favorite title, Apostle, another missionary pair does so. They are called as Apostles. In Romans 16, 7, Paul greets Andronicus and Junia, his co-patriots, uh, who have been in prison with him. Junia and Atronicus are described with more detail, my relative and my fellow prisoners. They are prominent among the apostles and they were in Christ before me, 167. Now, uh, the name Junia, there was a lot of uh, controversy. Uh, a lot of attempts were made to make this Junia a woman in the Junias a masculine name. Okay, because uh, the, the, you know, people uh, did not want to give a junior the title apostle, they tried to make junior into juniors. But uh, the translations having the masculine name juniors and other feminine name junior. But uh, now we have come to a consensus among the, a uh, lot of debates were going on on that. But now we have come to a consensus that it is the feminine name. It is the feminine name with the help of the extra uh, from the literature and from the history uh, we have affirmed that it is not Junius but it is Junia who is called the apostle. So the, uh, the, this letter of recommendation concludes Paul's epistle to the Romans mentions women's early Christian leadership only in a passing way. Okay only in a passing way. No elaboration is given there, but still mentions it. So it, it is a reference to early Christian women, therefore should be read as the tip of an iceberg, indicating what is submerged in grammatically masculine language. Although the indirect information conveyed by the list of greeting is very scanty, scanty it nevertheless allows us to learn something about the social status and the missionary activity of early Christians and the women's leadership roles in the early Christianity. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, what I try to say is um, the feminist interpretation of the New Testament are intended to give a flip to women everywhere, to understand and to appreciate their multifaceted roles in society and to encourage them to do their bit to free and liberate their own tribe, the other women, from the clutches of the so-called traditional modes, which enchain them as well as cripple them to the point of an annihilating their human personality fashioned in the image and likeness of God. This is the intention of the uh, feminist hermeneutics. Uh, this is why the women interpret the, the uh, scripture, um, particularly those passages pertaining to women. Okay. Wherever there is a woman in distress, a woman oppressed and maltreated, a woman assigned to a second place in the ladder of honor, a woman tortured and burned alive because she is not able to pay her dowry, a woman underpaid and undernourished and underestimated to them, the feminist hermeneutics tries to carry in action the liberative words which Jesus pronounced once to a crippled woman, you are free. Luke 13, 2. This is what endowed by the feminist hermeneutics. I have finished. Okay.
Thank you very much. Welcome, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> So thank you so much, uh, respected doctor, sister, uh, Prema Vakil for this wonderful presentation. And we all were privileged to have a theoretical framework of the feminist interpretation of the New Testament. And thank you so much for that. And it was an er erudite presentation. And uh, I may say a few more words after the Q and A session. And we have uh, some questions in the chat box uh, that I am reading. And uh, one question is uh, very scientific way of interpretation, sister. My question is: Is there a uh, women by Bible like children Bible that is asked by Shirley Jones uh, that you can answer alongside of uh, Reverend Mahbu uh, from Pakistan uh, does suspecting the text in order to uh, so to go somewhere else yeah does suspecting the text in order to discover more than Meets, uh, I note, imply suspecting the text divine inspiration. So, Reverend Mahbub, Mahbub, you can ask that question uh, to uh, Dr. Prema. That would okay, be so ideal. Yes. All right. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes okay. Yes. Yeah. My question was: Does suspecting the text? Uh, uh, in order to discover more than what is there or meets the eye, implies suspecting the divine inspiration of text as well? Okay. Can I answer? Yes, yes. Now, uh, to the first question, my answer is yes. There is the woman's Bible. Oh. There is. <laughs> I did not bring to show you. I even I have a <laughs> copy of that. Okay, mm -hmm. there is it. Because what they do is, uh, they have taken all the women characters in the Bible, mm -hmm. highlighted that, and in the side of the uh, the text, uh, give a, a, a short interpretation of that. Woman's woman's Bible. It is known as. Okay. So thank you so much. Any other questions? Okay. To the Friends. And to the next question, uh, mm. that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 this uh, inspiration, whether this uh, uh, taking the text more than what it is, whether it goes to the, uh, goes against inspiration, I think, you know, it doesn't go to the divine, against the divine inspiration, uh, because the, the Bible is in the, uh, in the words of human beings. So as long as the human beings are involved as the writers, there are limitations in that uh, there are, uh, you know, cultural limitations. There are the background from which the writer has come. All these have uh, entered into this uh, in, uh, into this uh, writing of the Bible. Therefore, if uh, I mean finding out more than what there is, uh, does not go against the divine inspiration. Yes. May May I add one? Doctor Nyanavaram. Doctor Nyanavaram. Yes. May yes. I add one sentence to this uh, answer? Thank you very much for the answer. That's perfectly true. Uh, last uh, um, week, uh, I was talking to the, uh, the other professor that uh, uh, text itself was an interpretation. You know, Jesus was the actual. Matthew an interpretation, Mark an interpretation, Luke an interpretation, and John an interpretation. So we need to uh, uh, suspect the text also because it was also an interpretation. I, I added this last week, so I will. I would like to tell that that we need to suspect the text as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that contribution. So, Ms. Uh, Shirley Jones. Yes, sir. I would like. Uh, thank you, sister, for a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to add one more doubt. While salvation, discipleship, eternal life, all these are eternal. 
why we are looking at the word of God, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit in these textual, contextual, uh, hermeneutics, interpretation, perspectives. Is it not our Lord God, Holy Spirit guiding us in understanding the word? This may help us. Why such a broad band of interpretations? <laughs> okay, I think uh, that answer I had already given in my first, the, my lecture began with that. My le lecture began with that, saying that uh, the no one interpretation can bring the, the depth of the meaning of the text because the biblical text is such. So one way of looking at it alone will not bring out the, the depth uh, meaning of the text. So therefore we need more and more interpretations to bring out uh, the full meaning of the text, what is uh, intended by the author and how it is applicable today because contexts are changing today. It is written in a context uh, which is very different, isn't it? So the context today is different for us. All right. The, so excuse me, sister. The text yeah. has to be interpreted in our context. Otherwise, the text will become uh, uh, in a dead text. If it is not applied into our context, it becomes a dead text. Do you mean to say, uh, uh, sister? Uh, uh, can I continue, sister? please? Yeah, the, can I ask, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you mean to say, say the present context, especially Asian or Indian, uh, is uh, women rape, you know? In that context also, are we interpreting something? Uh, that's what I was, uh, I think, mention, uh, mentioning a text, uh, speaking about it. Some of the texts, what we have it in the Old Testament judges, actually, uh, in the Old Testament, one, one I pointed out. In yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And they said, uh, sometimes they take it as a, um, you know, sanction uh, to, you know, to uh, procure or to contribute or develop or to uh, do the violence to women. Some, sometimes it takes it as a sanction. Therefore, we need to take this text and uh, in what context it was said then? What was the culture of that time? Are we not confusing because, everything? Pardon? Are we not putting <laughs> all this together, confusing uh, the way of uh, Christian life? Uh, I no, know. sorry, we are not confusing it. We are, we, are cer we are certainly, certainly uh, telling yes, the people sir. that we need to be very careful. Ama, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Salvation is equal to fullness of life. Yes, sir. Liber she was using liberation. Yes, liberation sir. and salvation are the same. So yeah. we are telling about the salvation, fullness of life, which has been denied to a, a one part of the whole humanity. So yes, we are talking about salvation. We are talking about freedom. We are talking about liberation. So please understand that. Okay. So thank you. Any any other questions? <laughs> any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Jenny. Dr. for this You're excellent welcome. presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, you said about Luke. Luke was not presenting uh, about another prophetess. Yes. Yeah, but we can see more uh, things about from Luke, who was presenting about this Mary's song of praise, Elizabeth's, yes. and all the things. No? Yes. So, can we find any feminist uh, viewpoints from Mary's or, or Elizabeth's uh, words or life from Luke, Luke and perspective? Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, the infancy narrative of Luke, uh, in, uh, in Luke presents all the characters in the infancy narrative are prophesying. You have Simon, Simeon is prophesying and he sings in the Benedictus. Uh, you have Mary is prophesying in the Magnificat and you have, uh, um, you have also uh, is the Zachariah is prophesying Benedictus actually. Uh, and Simeon in Luke the Methus, and my, uh, but these people are not termed as prophets or prophetesses, but their articulations are prophetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas uh, my question was here, 
Anna is termed, clearly termed, and there was also a prophetess called Anna, who along with the Simeon was witnessing uh, Jesus coming into the, uh, into the temple and recognized the Messiah. Yes. But the problem is, what happened to her prophecy there? That was my question, because there are uh, people who are not termed as prophets, but their prophecies are there. Here there is a woman who is termed, titled as prophetess, but no oracle is a thing. So can it be, because two oracles are given to Simeon, one is concerning the child Jesus, the other one concerning Mother Mary, uh, saying that a sword shall pierce. So can that be that the second prophecy, sword piercing her, can that be coming from the mouth of Anna? Okay, this is a question that I am putting forward. Can that be? Again, you have the prophecy of Elizabeth. Uh, I mean, the, when they met in the visitation, you have, you know, she is saying that you'll be called as the mother of my Lord. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to visit me? It is a prophecy, actually, uh, claiming Mary as the mother of uh, Jesus. Now, uh, now, what happens is uh, their look doesn't call her as a prophet, prophetess. One or other way, in the first chapters, the, all the figures are pro uh, prophesying. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Sister Dr. Prema Vagil. And uh, due to the lack of time, we are going to wind it up. And uh, you see that uh, some of the questions that are raised, so is that our group is a mixed group. Some are theologians, some are lay people. Okay, And we can expect any sort of questions from this group. So in that case, uh, uh, you will understand, okay, the questions that are coming up are from the ground realities as well as from the theological levels. And uh, so we are privileged uh, to have uh, uh, erudite scholars like uh, Jnanavaram and others uh, to respond, okay. And uh, so you are giving us a wonderful lecture, an excellent lecture, okay, with theoretical framework. Okay, what is feminism and the terminology of feminism, formulation for feminist interpretation, sorry, foundation, and history, principles, mothers, history of tradition, redaction critical, form critical, sorry, not form critical, textual critical, and hermeneutics of suspicion, liberation theological aspects, modern critical mothers, and uh, several other, okay, sorry, feminist hermeneutical mothers. And also, finally, you are trying to interpret and uh, bringing out a lot of insights from the Pauline okay, corpus. So in that way, we uh, are aware and we were informed okay, how to look at the New Testament scriptures okay, uh, in new lights. So that is the most important thing that we have learned today. And at the same time, we can put many of these theoretical aspects Okay, and the textual insights in today's context as women are struggling in multifarious contexts of our country and beyond internationally. And uh, we can uh, uh, declare solidarity with them as women are raped and women are dehumanized, ostracized and considered as the second class citizens in our country. And in that case, we can uh, especially men, not only men, we all uh, should declare solidarity with them. So that we can come up with the new insights. We can raise our voice. That is the most important thing. The most important thing is not hearing and going, but rather raising voice against injustice that is happening okay, around the world. So we are very happy that in the United States of America, okay, Vice President is chosen hmm, first time in history, okay, from the women folk. That is a pleasing moment. The same we can expect in the coming days, okay, uh, in theological seminaries, universities, and uh, uh, in churches. So we see major, a large number of women in this group also. Okay, you can raise your voice, but don't shout at your husbands. Okay, just fun. Huh? So I am trying to the 
raising voice in a different sense i am telling okay raising voice against injustice okay in the systemic framework of okay uh, the micro level as well as the meso level as well as the macro level uh, systemic framework where we can raise our voice and in that way we can come out in flying colors and we can declare victory as paul rightly says in galatians okay all are equal in christ there is neither jew nor gentile neither male nor female neither free nor slave all are one in christ okay that is considered as the magna carta of christian faith okay that has to be lifted up and as i am a johannian student you see that always i look at the johannian women with the highlight so is that john goes more highlight for women characters than men characters in his gospel the samaritan woman is that about 46 verses 44 verses are set apart so jesus mother comes in the key two crucial roles in john's gospel on that right at the beginning of jesus public ministry on right at the end of jesus public ministry so mary and martha and mary of magdalene is considered as the apostola apostolorum apostle to the apostles so in that case okay johanne narrator also comes out okay in flying colors with the feminist okay insights and interpretations so thank you so much uh, professor uh, dr sister prema wakil for this erudite and excellent theoretically uh, framed okay interpretation and uh, lecture may god bless you thank you with regard to next week and is that next week is the 24th lecture that is going to be the last lecture mm. okay for example is that 24 that is going to be 19th and the following week we are going to have a grand graduation 26th okay i am hopeful that you all are excited about the graduation so next week our lecture is going to be reading new testament in the context of the pandemic covid 19 context mm. Mm. okay reading new testament in the context of the pandemic covid 19 context i don't know the name of the okay a lecture for next week okay i don't know okay so uh it is going to be myself okay none other than so is that the assignment for next week is uh, feminist interpretation of the new testament and its significance in today's context okay in 300 words you have to write feminist interpretation of the new testament and its significance for today's context and uh, we had uh, about 120 people attended today's lecture and we are privileged to have a wonderful time and uh, now it is over to millun thank you so much thank you uh, once again we would like to thank sister prema for the wonderful lecture she had given to us i feel like it was such a mind blowing though i miss some of the uh, i mean sessions in between because of some other uh, responsibility over here and thank you so much dr johnson uh, for moderating and chairing the session as uh, dr Z- uh, johnson has just announced next week will be the last lecture and uh, maybe within few days we will update uh, your assignment records and also your name since we are planning to make a certificate we would like to kindly request you to check your name the spelling whether we are writing correctly and then you please help us to make things in a perfect way thank you so much once again and have a wonderful evening thank you thank you, thank you.